Thank you very much. It's really wonderful to be here. I knew Elving Anderson, and he was a really kind and thoughtful person. Very, I very much admired him, so it's a special privilege for me to be here. The last time I was in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, um, actually I was in Minnesota just six weeks ago to do grand rounds at Mayo Clinic, but the time before that, when I was actually in Minneapolis, I, um, I was flown in by Jesse Ventura. So he wanted to interview me about human-animal chimeras. I, I didn't know. I thought it'd be interesting. <laughs> so I, I said yes. They, they got me all, got me to put a suit on, told me they were going to take me to a studio and we were going to have a formal interview. And then they ambushed me in the parking garage, some old parking garage downtown Minneapolis, and did the interview there, standing up. So. Um, I had decided I wasn't going to take any trouble from Jesse Ventura, so when I met him, the first thing I did, I put up my hand and I said, now I want you to know I was a wrestler in high school, and if you give me any trouble, I'm going to pin you. <laughs> so I, I want to talk with you, um, my, my special interest, notwithstanding my heavy involvement in the President's Council work on, on um, stem cell research, my, my deepest interest is in ethical issues associated with advances in neuroscience. And so I want to talk with you about that. And this is not an easy subject, um, but it is an interesting one. <laughs> so I, I hope that, um, that you will see why, um, in spite of many urgent and difficult issues currently on our plate, there are some very, very difficult ones that we better start getting ready for. So a while back, I saw an article about how archaeologists are using high-resolution satellite images to peer into the past from the distance of space. These multispectral images, drawn from the NASA database, allow remote subsurface sensing and identification analysis of layer upon layer of ancient human sites buried under the millennial drifts of sediments and sands. There's an evident drama in this jarring juxtaposition of high technology humans unearthing the primitive remnants of their earliest ancestral origins. In a dry riverbed, a tailless slope, or the plowed rows of upturned sod, there's a flint arrowhead a bright bead or a jagged fragment of painted pottery. Then another layer, there's iron, bronze, and glass, the plow and the wheel, then engines powered by steam, radios, radar, and another hundred years we've lifted into orbit above the earth and are looking down on the cradle of our civilization. What a drama. One can only imagine the individual lives the hands and minds through whom this creative ascent toward comprehension and control has come, struggling forward against all adversity in the face of disorder, disease, and death. They set the foundation and forged the living link from the challenges of basic biological survival to the high technology culture of the modern world. Driven by desperation, and drawn forth by the inspired ideal. What an amazing species we are. Someone once said that human beings are more different from animals than animals are from plants. Well, that might be overstating things a little, but there's no question that we have a radically different relationship within the order of nature. Nowhere is this distinguishing character of human nature more clearly expressed than in our medical capacities to rescue and restore, and our sense of solidarity, solidarity, compassion, and moral obligation in the face of these basic realities of suffering. And one of the great challenges of a current, in the current arena of medical uh, science and, and clinical care is the one of the exciting dimensions is the rapid advance in the vast and tragic realm of neurologic and psychiatric disease. 
Yet for all the good of this outward thrust of life, comprehending life, there is a troubling dimension to this combination of power and open aspiration, what the philosopher Hans Jonas called a progressive scale of freedom and peril. The very capacities of our comprehending mind and idealizing imagination have become a potential danger to us. What began in the conquest of adversity and the service of survival moves on toward wider goals of encompassing control and the satisfaction of broader appetites and ambitions beyond health, beauty, strength, intelligence, longevity, or maybe just technologically managed happiness. Consider how advances in biotechnology are already reshaping our relationship with the world, our, society, our social realities, and our sense of personal identity and destiny. Along with our new powers, a new meaning of medicine is emerging, and with it a dramatic transformation in our understanding of human place and human purpose. The traditional role of medicine was to cure disease and alleviate suffering, to restore and sustain the patient to a natural level of functioning and well-being. The medical arts were in the service of a wider reverence and, and respect for the order of the created world. This idea was put succinctly by the Roman physician Galen when he said, the physician is only nature's assistant. But now, with the powers of our advancing biotechnology, there's a new paradigm, one of liberation, technological transformation in the quest for happiness and human perfection. Consider how slowly but steadily the scope and purpose of medicine have already extended along the gradient of our appetites and ambitions to encompass dimensions of life not previously considered matters of health, but just natural human variations or limitations. From sleeping pills, to diet pills, to orthodontia, to Rogaine, the younger people among them might not know that this is to cure baldness. When I started medical school, baldness wasn't a disease, but be that as it may. Um, so what after another, these, these technologies that change the human world, the birth control pill, breast augmentation, Viagra, to name a few of the more controversial ones. Now we have something called ProVigil. It's a drug that allows prolonged periods of wakefulness and seasonale a technological bypass to the monthly, monthly periodicity of the natural menstrual cycle. In all these ways, we have altered and revised the given frame of nature. Regardless of what you think about those things, you have to admit it's changed human realities. Increasingly, we've come to expect from medicine not just freedom from disease, but freedom from distress, struggle, and even the constraints of a natural life process. From all that is unattractive, imperfect, or just inconvenient. And now there are proposals for projects of a more ambitious scope, for the conquest of aging, fundamental genetic and neurologic revision, and guided evolution. Proposals for post-humans, transhumans, and techno-sapiens. Clearly, our advancing biomedical technology has enormous implications beyond its direct therapeutic application, issues right at the core of human identity, human dignity, and by some accounts, the future of our species. And nowhere is this more true than in the arena of advancing neurotechnology. There is already broad and passionate public interest in these technologies, a media-fueled mix of exaggerated expectations and deep apprehensions. On the one side is a network of activist scholars called the Center for Cognitive Liberty, dedicated to fostering, this is a quote, fostering the unlimited potential of the human mind. They're joined by the transhumanists, an international intellectual and cultural movement advocating technologically mediated enhancement of human intellectual, physical, and psychological capacities. Their logo is H+. You, you get it? Humans+. Plus. 
I've had several of the leaders of the Stanford Transhumanist Society in my classes. They're intelligent and serious-minded students. They argue that our advancing neurotechnologies offer us an opportunity to escape the constraints and cruelties of an amoral evolutionary process, to lift humanity to its next level of personal and social flourishing as human-machine post-human hybrids. On the other side of public opinion, of course, there is deep and almost apocalyptic apprehension about that the idea of concern is that neurotechnology spells the ultimate arrogance and the final degradation and dissolution of human dignity. So as our biotechnology extends, we need to take these perspectives seriously. We need to take them seriously because there's lots of positive things can come out of our technologies. We don't want to get in terrible controversies over them, but we have to take them seriously because they're very powerful and could extend greater and greater control of the human mind. There are very real social and ethical issues that we need to consider. As we enter these uncharted territories, we need a broad social dialogue that draws on our deepest scientific insights as well as the repository of human experience and wisdom preserved in our philosophical and religious traditions. Recognizing the extraordinary challenge and serious significance of such a dialogue, the President's Council on Bioethics undertook a multi-year inquiry exploring the implications of employing our advancing biomedical technologies in projects beyond the traditional realm and reach of medicine. In our report, Beyond Therapy, Biotechnology and the Pursuit of Happiness, we discussed the historical foundations of our quest for mastery over nature, the limitations of using a medical model when considering these matters, and the importance of establishing a comprehensive foundation for their ethical evaluation. We then consider a series of specific applications of biotechnology for purposes beyond therapy in chapters that we titled beyond, Better Babies, Super, Superior Performance, Aging Bodies, you get the idea. In what follows, I will draw on this report while extending its discussion with further thoughts from my own perspective. And I want to say from the onset, I offer these, these comments, these reflections in a spirit of constructive dialogue. I, I'm sometimes introduced simply as a bioethicist. Um, frankly, I abjure the term. I, I, I don't think bioethics is a profession. Sorry if some of you are bioethicists, but I, I just think, don't think it's, it's just too, it's about everything in a way. It's, it's really a conversation um, with a full range of professional perspectives needed indeed, not just professional perspectives, but the whole human family. Um, I think of myself not as a bioethicist, but as a physician and a citizen, adding the reflections of my personal and professional ex experience. So I'm not trying to impose the final word on this. I just want to get you thinking. I want to start by laying out a broad perspective on the notion of rewiring the brain and the range of projects that are underway or being proposed. And none of what I'm going to tell you is total fantasy. It's not just science fiction. These are things that are all being done. Then I'll proceed um, to provide some general comments on the ethics and the use of biomedical technology beyond therapy and conclude with more focused discussion of specific ethical issues associated with neurological intervention. I thought it'd be interesting to start with this, this quote from Aristotle. Can everybody see? I guess you can all see that. Um, I, thought, I thought it was interesting because it raises an interesting question. What did he mean? Is, is this a call to caution? Or in our age, is it a call to action to rewire the brain? It's important to acknowledge at the onset of how dramatic our natural capacity to rewire the brain actually is. 
we rewire the brain when, when I'm hoping anyway, when my students come to my classroom, their brains are getting rewired. But that's a natural process. And though many of our current technologies are altering the way that takes place, social media and, and, um, and smartphones and so forth, they're still within the realm of natural response of the organism to the technology. However, advances in biotechnology broadly and neurotechnology are now offering really new and challenging possibilities. And they're coming on the back of very, very well-intended uh, scientific and medical efforts to try to overcome very deep, difficult, and serious uh, disorders that hum burden human beings very much. After major advances against diseases on every other body system, we are finally at the point of truly contending with the vast and tragic arena of neurologic and psych psychiatric disorders. This slide was supposed to go with the idea that learning is part of natural life and, and rewiring your brain in conformity with your purposes and your culture is essentially true. But what goes wrong in natural human life is also very real. And, and I want to lay out for you the, the scope of this. Um, it's awesome and it's amazing. According to the National Institute of Neurologic Disease and Stroke, there are more than 600 distinct disorders of the nervous system. They directly affect 50 million Americans at a cost of over half a trillion dollars a year. More than 15 million people live with a major chronic neurologic disease, including 5 million with Alzheimer's. Uh, that's projected to triple in the next 40 years. Uh, another million live with Parkinson's disease. That's just in America. And nearly 25% of adult Americans live with chronic pain at a medical and social cost estimated at over $635 billion a year. One in 68 children is born with something that qualifies to be on the, spec on the autism um, spectrum disorder um, range. Um, that's serious autism all the way up to what's called Asperger's syndrome. Um, one in 68 children, isn't that amazing? And one in four adults, over 60 million a year, experience some form of mental illness in any given year. One eighth live with a major chronic mental illness, including over two million with schizophrenia, six million with bipolar disorder, otherwise known as manic depressive illness, and 15 million with major depression. And nearly one and nearly one in 10 Americans over the age of 12 is classified with an addictive disorder at a medical and social cost estimated at $525 billion a year. Now, fortunately, advances in molecular biology, neurophysiology, and anatomy, together with new techniques and imaging of imaging and new interventions are opening extraordinary new avenues of therapeutic advance. And there's lots of exciting stuff coming from uh, neuroscience in the realm of therapy. In a broad sense, many of these technologies aim to rewire the brain, to restore synaptic balance in neural circuits, reset basic reward systems in addicts, or release the emotionally laden memories of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. All these in the service of reestablishing health, our natural capacities to think and to act. The benefits of such therapeutic interventions are self-evident, but the potential to use the same new knowledge and control to go beyond therapy is very real. A century of experience with modern psychopharmacology has taught us the power of basic biomolecules, such as dopamine and serotonin, to rewire the brain. Increasing knowledge of genomics and developmental biology, together with new methods of drug delivery, will no doubt lead to dramatic additional advances in therapy and in targeted enhancements of natural powers. For example, 
There are currently over 50 neuropsychiatric clinical trials of oxytocin. You all know what oxytocin is, right? It's so-called cuddling hormone, the, the love hormone. F over 50 neuropsychiatric clinical trials exploring the possibility of remedial wiring of neurologic and psychiatric disorders ranging from autism to schizophrenia. But oxytocin plays a role in a range of social dynamics, from basic sexual functioning to trust, bonding, and in-group solidarity, and also out-group aggression. Will we finally have an antidote to shyness or an adjuvant for marriage counseling? And what will come of DARPA's, that's the research arm of the Department of Defense, what will come of their interest in using oxytocin as a gentle persuader in military interrogation, or as the biochemical mediator of platoon loyalty and self-sacrifice? How's that for an idea? Moreover, it's been suggested that oxytocin could be de delivered directly to the brain using strategically placed implants and wireless remote control. New techniques using biosynthetic scaffolds seeded with neural stem cells may allow us to generate a wide range of functional units of neurologic tissues, possibly using 3D printing technologies. These could be programmed uh, using emerging technology called optogenetics so that tiny, tiny targeted light beams uh, could, could strategically release the uh, neuromodulator in, a, in precise spatial and temporal control. So that's, that's a strange and futuristic possibility, but it seems uh, feasible. One can imagine a wide range of uses of such a remotely controlled release of neuromodulators, especially if accompanied by um, implanted monitors that could detect early warning signs of anxiety or aggression or even deviant sexual proclivities such as, such as pedophilia. That, that's the uh, optogenetics, the way it shines in and it causes the cell to fire. So will we, will we uh, maybe won't we use this for normal, normal on the street human beings, but what about in certain circumstances of untreatable diseases and disorders, um, especially social diseases, crime. There are already projects underway to develop implantable networks of neural prostheses that mimic and protect, potentially extend the function of whole brain modules. Scientists at UFC have reported that a microchip implanted in a rat's brain can take on some of the functions of the hippocampus encoding memory patterns, and then relaying them for functional implementation. A whole unit of the brain that is, at least in preliminary studies, able to do some of the tasks of the natural brain tissue. One can only imagine what possibilities, both wonderful and weird, might come from such approaches. Some years ago, a study reported that transplanted fetal hamster superchiasmatic nucleo, nuclei, it's a part of the brain that controls the daily rhythms, circadian rhythms. They took this part of the brain from fetal hamsters, put it into aging hamsters, and it extended, it regularized their daily rhythm, their diurnal rhythm, and extended their lifespan by 30%. Will we now manufacture such units and implant them in human beings? There are also reports that electronic implants have established stable reorganization of motor output. The, the uh, uh, that was back here. Uh, that's, that was for the circadian rhythm. Old people are the ones that have the most trouble with their sleep and wake cycles. And that's why reestablished and they may extend lifespan. There, there are reports now of electronic implants that are able to establish reorganization of motor output, that means muscle movements, by inducing artificial connections between two sites in the motor cortex that, that normally don't, don't operate together. And this has been done in monkeys. 
And this method for inducing functional reorganization may have extraordinary practical applications in neurorehabilitation after injury, for example. Or it could be used to reorganize the functional dynamics of conceptual, analytical, or motivational systems. Some neurobiologists believe that the equivalent, though pathological reorganization may already exist in some, some cases of people with the extraordinary artistic and mathematical abilities seen in, in um, acquired savant syndrome. Acquired savant syndrome, some autistic children are born like this, but sometimes people undergo um, some experience like an auto accident or something and start to realize in the following weeks that they have extraordinary capacities that they didn't previously realize um, in, their, in their personality before. And some of them do end up doing extraordinary things like, like being able to sit down at the piano and in a matter of a few weeks just become absolutely proficient at playing anything. And I want to show you um, one of these, um, a, a, a video. I hope this sound will work. Th this is an extraordinary um, story. This fellow was born autistic. He didn't speak till he was nine. He's dysfunctional on a lot of levels. But, but, oops, let's see if we can get this to go. That's enough, but isn't that amazing? How can that even be possible? It, it appears that, that uh, it's a rebalancing of basic neural circuits somehow, and scientists are interested in the idea of using transcranial direct current stimulation to temporarily provoke such changes in subjects. They've been doing studies and actually have found out that they can boost certain powers, certain mathematical um, abilities, uh, reasoning abilities, temporarily by, by unbalancing the current status of the brain, emphasizing some capacities over another. One enthusiastic journalist put it this way, genius lies in all of us just waiting to be unleashed. Well, more immediately, deep brain stimulation, a kind of neurologic pacemaker that sends electrical impulses through implanted electrodes to specific brain regions is already bringing relief to hundreds of thousands of people with Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, and epilepsy. Deep brain stimulation, I, I've seen uh, one of these operations, by the way, for, for uh, Parkinson's disease. It is amazing. They, they uh, get this all set up. They put the electrode down through the brain. It doesn't really, the, the cells mostly push out of the way. They only take a few cells out, and we've got um, 100,000 neurons, basically. So, uh, so it doesn't damage the brain. They put this into the patient who's just shaking like this, and then the moment came, they turned it on and asked him to touch his nose, and he just went like that. It was just absolutely like a miracle to watch it. Deep brain stimulation is now being explored for possible use with obsessive compulsive disorder, PTSD, major depression, borderline personality disorder, and general anxiety disorder, as well as traumatic brain injury, addiction, and chronic pain. But you wonder what else might it be good for? During one experimental procedure for obsessive compulsive disorder, the research doctor asked the patient to, to quote, describe what you're feeling right now with an ecstatic smile on her face, in a voice giddy with joy, the woman replied, I feel happy. One journalist described this as a peek into a possible future where human happiness is the product, not of the experiences and relationships that make up a life, but of an elective surgical procedure, a facelift for the brain. I kind of doubt it, but interesting. Um, another extraordinary new technology, brain-computer interfacing. That that's, that's shows how they get the probe in just the right way. Another extraordinary technology is brain-computer interfacing. 
It's, um, all, it is actually close to practical application in serious therapeutic settings. This is sometimes referred to as mind-machine interface. It allows a direct communication pathway between the brain and an external device. Grids of tiny electrodes are pressed onto the surface of the motor cortex, the outside of the brain, um, the area that controls muscle movement, and, um, and they monitor the nerve signals, um, the electrical signals from the nerves below. And these signals are then transmitted wirelessly to a computer which analyzes the pattern and forwards the mental intentions. It decodes what the brain was trying to get its own muscles to do, but its own muscles are paralyzed. But the computer can decode these messages, send them to a robotic arm that's attached alongside the place where a normal arm would be for a monkey. And they're now doing these with human beings as well, but the monkey's more interesting than the video of the monkey. So what this shows you, I want to tell you what it is before I turn it on, because the, um, then you'll really see what's happening. The monkey's arms are bound down to its side in, in plastic um, tubes, so he can't move his own arms. Uh, you can see his right hand in the plastic tube. Um, and the robotic arm then is shoved right against his shoulder as though it were his arm. And he thinks, he thinks left arm, move and get the marshmallow. And that is decoded by the computer and his arm moves and the robotic arm moves. So, so uh, watch how amazing this is. All just by thought, not by any of his own muscles. So this may one day reopen the world of motion to patients with quadriplegia, but it could also create amazing possibilities for uses beyond therapy to bypass the motor system, extend the senses, and even facilitate direct brain-to-brain -brain communication. There's a lot of speculation uh, about all this, but also serious incremental advance in such projects including reports by a researcher at Duke of rat studies in which infrared detectors were connected to electrodes in the part of the brain that responds to touch. These studies extend earlier findings that regions of the sensory cortex that naturally process one sense can be recruited to interpret and functionally respond to a whole different type of sensory information and will even rewire in ways that optimize the new sensory processing. So our brains are very plastic. They can be recruited to a lot of new and different things. I didn't have a picture of this, so I just thought that was interesting. But um, <laughs> <laughs> more recently, these same researchers reported computer-mediated brain-to-brain communications in rats, one in a lab at Duke and the other in Brazil. What happens is the first rat was given a visual cue, visual cue that guided it to press a lever to get a reward. The second rat did not see the visual cue. He's off in Brazil anyway. Uh, but instead, he made his choice, which was correct 70% of the time, based solely on receiving the transmission of the first rat's brain activity. He decoded the the uh, activity by learning what it meant. Moreover, the first rat got an added reward if the second rat chose correctly, and in what the researcher described as behavioral collaboration, the first rat became more decisive and generated clearer brain signals. According to reports, the same researcher has described this study as the first step toward the linking of multiple minds to form an organic computer or brain net that would allow sharing of information among groups of animals, connections that might even lead to one animal incorporating another animal's sense of self. Not so sure, but that's what he said. He explains, we're doing everything wireless and experimenting with swarms of rats. Of course, such possibilities depend on a reliable and interpretable representation of brain states. 
Some research scientists suggest that our human mechanisms of mind and mental representations may share enough common in common to make this possible, at least on a primary level. According to an article in the New York Times, researcher Gershwin Schalk dreams, this is a quote, he dreams of letting people speak with their neurons, issuing silent commands to their machines. You could imagine the word cat, say, and it would pop up on your computer screen. The area involved with imagined speech takes up just a few centimeters of the brain, so you wouldn't have to cover the whole brain with these, these um, electrodes. And there are, there are reports that DARPA hopes to use this silent speech to invisibly and instantaneous, in instantaneously coordinate groups of soldiers on the battlefield. Moreover, there are reports that Intel Corporation is developing brain implants that will let people control their phones or computers without needing keyboards, touchpads, or touchscreens. Dean, Dean Pomelo, an engineer based at Carnegie Mellon University who leads Intel's brain-computer initiative, reacts to skeptics and explains, eventually people may be willing to be more committed to brain implants. Imagine being able to surf the web with the power of your thoughts. And a video gaming blogger with the propitious name of Marshall Brain explains, this is a quote, we would like to play video games by having our brains existing sensory and motor pathways directly connected to the console. This would allow perfect, seamless immersion in a game world. Boy, I don't know, I'm not letting them put these things in my brain. It's obvious from this brief and incomplete survey that we are on the exploratory edge of innovation, an amazing mix of hopeful projects and mere speculation. Indeed, neurotechnology is the most recent and vibrant, vibrant expression of the technological spirit, a desire to understand, order, and ultimately control the workings of nature, all pursued for the sake of human benefit. In the memorable words of Francis Bacon, to relieve man's estate. A report from the National Science Foundation declares, this is a quote too, at this unique moment in the history of tech of technical achievement, improvement of human performance becomes possible, and such improvement could achieve a golden age that would be a turning point for human productivity and quality of life. But what exactly is it about man's estate, a lot of humankind, that needs or invites improvement? It's clear that as we go beyond the treatment of disease and the pursuit of health, we have no ready-made or reliable professional standards to guide our choices. And there's a gray zone, even in the definition of health. Many human traits are on a continuum of expression with no clear boundaries defining pathology. And in any case, will we now treat criminal behavior as a disease? Our personality, and I think it is probably in some cases, some degree of disease, but how complicated is that gonna be? But are personality differences a, a disease? That's a little more complicated. What about educational aptitudes and aging? Are they proper targets for medical interventions? Such medicalization quickly blends over into ideology and social control. Consider the case of drapetomania, from the Greek roots meaning a passion to run away. It was a defined pathology in the medical textbooks of the antebellum South. And of course, we all know the treatment was whipping. So ideology and medical definition are always closely related. So there's no clear line between therapy and enhancement. We are left with no choice but to do the hard work of ethics, to discern the nature and means toward the fullness of human freedom, dignity, and flourishing of life. Quite a dilemma, actually, isn't it? If we turn now, and with the understanding of our scientific perspective, 
look back at the natural origins of life, we may gain some insights that can frame our ethical reflections and their significance for the human future. 350 years ago, Blaise Pascal noted that human existence is located between infinities, between the infinitely large and the infinitely small, the vastness of cosmic space and the tiniest subatomic particles, the frenzy of molecular motion and the seeming changeless background, backdrop of geologic time, human existence located between infinities. Embodied, evolved, and embedded within the ecology of life, we have been shaped in body and mind by the forces of the earth, framed and constrained by the very forces that formed us. Indeed, the very word human shares the Latin root of our earth, of our, of our, it shares the Latin root of our word earth or soil, humus, human. We are the creatures of the earth. As the culmination of the central evolutionary theme of stable continuity and creative elaboration, we are the fullest extension of a phylogenetic trajectory toward integrated awareness, understanding, and capacity for action. Intelligent creatures in an intelligible world. We are a general purpose organism one that adapts by adaptability and comprehensive control. Yet within this frame of freedom, the meaning of our lives, their joys, generosities, and sense of transcendent significance are grounded in the very structure and flow of our physical being. Several preliminary points relating to the potential dangers of technology are immediately obvious. Within the constraints of the natural world, Desires, our appetites and, pa and passions, provide directions. These directions motivate and empower purposeful action. But desires are not destinations, they're directions. Natural needs and desires keep us socially interconnected and often serve purposes hidden from our natural, normal re reflections, including some of the richest and most meaningful realities such as the connection between eating and nourishment, the con connection between sexuality and procreation. Now, in our e technological era, desires have increasingly become ends in themselves. Natural urges and inclinations are treated as a kind of resource, like a playground for exploration and self-indulgence with all the disproportions and dangers that implies. A kind of voluntary self-degradation. Equally troubling are the direct social dangers, the pervasive and corrosive competition with others, where biotechnology is deployed in the service of vanity or pride, or simply the unbridled quest for position, power, and prestige. Think Vance, Lance Armstrong, for example. Finally, and most disturbing, there is at least the possibility that the powers of neurotechnology will be deployed by certain nation states in coercive programs of social engineering and social control, all in the name of building a better world. Notwithstanding the seriousness of these individually chosen or socially imposed violations of human dignity, they are, at least in principle, nothing new to human experience. What is new and what became the central focus of the President's Council's considerations are those beyond thera therapy uses of biotechnology that would appeal to free and enterprising people, that would require no coercion and no, and most crucially, they would satisfy widespread human desires. Here the well-intended improvements or augmentation of personal capacities seem to go with the grain of human aspiration and admirable personal and social goals. Would that not be a logical extension of our powers over nature and a quantitative contribution to the measure of human dignity? Alas, it may be exactly the opposite. In seeking to escape our natural limitations, 
we may break the very connections and conditions that are the solid foundation of flourishing and the source of our deepest sense of significance and satisfaction. If we return now to further reflections on our, on our embodied being, we can consider more deeply the very character of human consciousness and the potential dangers of disrupting its natural process through technological intervention. And here I use the term consciousness somewhat loosely to mean self-awareness, mental reflection, and rationality, what we generally mean when we use the word thinking. This capacity for conscious thought is so central to our sense of self that we cannot easily step back to ponder its grounding in our physical being. Yet when we consider its biological origins and its crucial role in survival, it is obvious that consciousness is the culmination of a wider phenomenon within the story of life. If we trace the phylogenetic developments of the brain from its earliest beginnings some 500 billion years ago, it's evident that human consciousness is built upon more primary neurologic patterns intimately associated with body regulation, integration of sensory input, and the control of body action within the world. As neurologist Antonio Damasio explains, the body, as represented in the brain, constitutes the indispensable frame of reference for the neural processes that we experience as mind. This primary platform of fundamental neurophysiology and intentional behavior is, is in the service, lived in the service of survival, is experienced as awareness, action, and desire. It, yet this part that is unknown to us in its biology is the core of what we know of as our minds. This means that our capacity for conscious reasoning itself is grounded in fine-tuned balance of primary evaluations, emotions, and body responses, even as it constructs more abstract symbolic realities. The, the point I'm trying to make is that we don't just come out of thin air. We are grounded, embodied, and the deep systems of our natural bodies are crucial to the higher order expressions of our mind. Damasio continues, the evolved body states and responses encoded as emotions carry implicit biological value and together with the instruments of logic are essential in rationality, allowing us to reason in consonance with a sense of personal future, social connection, and moral, per moral principle. Without the emotions, we couldn't think clearly. Our mind then is grounded in the very flesh and flow of biology's structures and life's dynamic process, the inwardness of self-awareness, imagination, and aspiration are mental extensions in the service of life. Against the dualistic error of the Enlightenment, it's evident that the human person is an inseparable psychophysical unity rooted in the earliest manifestations of our material form. Our thinking is in and through our bodily being. Several dangers from biomedical intervention are immediately apparent. First, in seeking to improve our neurological capacities, either through altered genes or drugs, or even some kind of direct brain-computer interface, we may disrupt the essential physical foundations and fragile balance of our neurologic functioning. Proponents of using direct neural interfacing for purposes beyond serious therapeutic interventions may, us, may, may underestimate the delicate equilibrium within the natural channels of sensory, of sensory input, analysis, and action. Our awareness, our, that is our sense of ourself, hovers like a mental map suspended in space. It feels disembodied. In fact, it's continuously updated through millions of sensory inputs that provide a constantly monitored and revised image 
of our state of bodily being. The flow of these inputs is harmoniously governed through highly refined channels that might be easily overloaded, unbalanced, or otherwise drastically disrupted. So if we have a direct input to our brain, we could disrupt crucial balances in our functioning. Likewise, projects to augment or extend the range of our senses, the balance and cross-modal referencing of the senses, may provide a privileged perspective and the foundation of our comprehensive understanding and extension of thought. That is to say, if we disrupt the balance, we disrupt the privileged cross-modal engagement of our senses. V.S. Ramachandran has suggested that the blending of the natural senses most dramatically evident in synesthesia, for example, where letters or numbers are perceived as inherently colored, may, at a, may in a normal life, or more common life, uh, be, provide the similar explanation for our natural capacity for making metaphors, metaphorical statements, the basis of much of our abstract thought and symbolic language. So for example, it turns out that, that um, the, the um, place where we s sense things to be disgusting in a moral sense are, are closely related um, anatomically to the so source of our gustation, our, our sense of taste. We, have, we use the sense of taste to, as a metaphorical explanation of why something is distasteful or, or disgusting to us morally. Most of our language, much of our language, is just filled with body metaphors by, based on the natural experience of our bodies as commonly experienced one person to another. And their basis of communication. Without that common bodily experience, we wouldn't be able to commute, communicate our thoughts and feelings. The same concern arises with projects to technologically re reorder or rebalance basic cognitive functions to gain new talent. The extraordinary powers of the acquired savant movie I showed you, they came at a cost, a terrible, they were purchased at a terrible price. That fellow is unable to operate effectively in many realms of natural life that you have no trouble at all doing. Loss of overarching integrated intelligence to get what he's got, and probably also the loss of clear judgment and self-governance. This brings us to a second and more subtle concern, that associated with neurological interventions in mood, memory, and other mental capacities. And here the pharmacologic psychoactive drugs are the most realistic technology of concern. Lots of people are already taking drugs to study better for exams and stuff, but there's whole programs for for um, nootropics, they call them, and a variety of brain-enhancing drugs. These drugs would theoretically influence neuromodulatory processes and so forth. And, and uh, it raises a lot of challenging possibilities because we already know that we use some of these on a daily basis in a low-grade sort of way. I'm not talking, though, about interventions for serious diseases. I'm not talking about trivial uses like coffee and red wine. I had a little coffee on my way here this morning. But uh, I'm talking about serious interventions to try to, to gain um, real advantages in rewiring or improving human brains. We, we are all aware that already that certain certain drugs such as Prozac, Ritalin, and Provigil, so forth, have provoked a lot of controversy and widespread concern that we're on the threshold of a technological management and radical transformation of the human mind. Some people say, well, why should we not use every means available to extend human capacities for perception, performance, or pleasure? 
Why should we not technologically moderate the powers of our minds as tools of our intentions or manage our moods as we do the surface appearance of our bodies? So much of medicine is now influenced by the paradigm of cosmetic surgery. So why not do the equivalent of our minds? Um, are we not by nature open and indeterminate, free to express our deepest desires and become whatever we can? Well, what is needed is a deeper level of reflection on the character of the embodied mind and the significance of the natural connection between mechanism, purpose, and human meaning. A thoughtful reconsideration of the actual operations of our conscious self-awareness will lead us to a recognition of the inseparable connection between conscious experience, memory, and personal identity. Through conscious intention, just think of how a child learns. Through conscious, conscious intention, we place our self and our actions on the world within the circle of cause and effect. In experiencing the connection between free agency, action, and outcome, we probe and penetrate the world, learning at once both the nature of the world and our place and powers within it. Childhood, and it's a good thing children are as incapable as they are because they would otherwise explore in all sorts of dangerous ways, but they go out and slowly, layer upon layer, establish their identity through their sense of their own powers and possibilities and the nature of the world they're in. Each experience is consolidated as memory, flexibly available to be recalled for specific situations while providing the platform for both continuity of personal identity and an ever wider comprehension of the world. This natural capacity for comprehensive understanding and capable action within the world is the highest adaptation in the history of life and to violate or attenuate its formative power is to lose the very strength of our species and the meaning of our lives. Yet that's exactly the effect of the psychoactive drugs when used not to restore the natural balance but to amplify or improve human abilities. Disconnected from the coordinated engagement of both memory and conscious intention, the drug-enhanced effect is not an action of the self, but an exogenous intervention acting on the self. Like some kind of neo-magical agent, this bypasses the natural channel of self-conscious control and undercuts the connection between the person and the perception, performance, or pleasure produced. Whether it be focused attention, calm or fine muscle control, or a pharmacologically induced ebullience of mood, it does not have the same meaning as the equivalent power produced through the natural continuity and, and integrity of personal process. It disengages us, it disengages us from ourself, short-circuiting the connection between effort and satisfaction, and it alienates us from others, shortcutting to a competitive advantage that is corrosive to the very meaning of human community. To damage these fundamental relations is to lose the very freedom we seek to gain. Self-control is ultimately the foundation for understanding others, which in turn makes possible the capacity for genuine communication and continuity of culture with its attendant magnification of consciousness. Seeking to enhance the power of the parts through technological transcendence of the limitations of our given nature, we are thrown back to a disorder and disharmony of the whole. We erode the very intelligibility of the world we are seeking to understand. So, these reflections on the ethical application of our advancing biomedical technology lead us to one final consideration. Is there no moral use for our new powers beyond therapy? And here the term pursuit of happiness, drawn from our constitution and in the title of our, our council's report, here the term pursuit of happiness carries a special meaning. 
Clearly, the Founding Fathers had in mind something more than superficial subjectivity of satisfaction, like having fun. Rather, in the deepest Aristotelian sense, happiness is activity in accordance with virtue, the fullest expression and excellence of our particular nature as human beings. Sorry, I lost my last pages. That's okay. I can tell you what I was going to say. <laughs> so, so what is what is real, real pursuit of happiness? Well, I think it has to do with with one of the reasons we're gathered here, and that is because those of us who are practicing Christians are very aware of the deep and difficult nature of the natural world. The natural world is at once profoundly beautiful, ordered, um, carries a deep meaning. It's source of, of a, a great admiration for the Creator. And yet it's filled with turmoil and trouble, as I said in the beginning, disease, disorder, and death. How is it that we contend with this? How do we balance the powers of our technology against such a world? So much depends on where you think such a world came from. If you think it came from an aimless and amoral evolutionary process, then you might step forward like the transhumanists and say, we can do better here. I'm not quite sure where they expect to get the wisdom to do better. Um, but nonetheless, you might critique it that way. However, if you see the world as still meaningfully aligned by the purposes of the Creator, then you start to understand that the world as given has very evident goodness in it, very evident places where in the spirit of love we can intervene, and then some that are ambiguous. But in those that are ambiguous, we need to apply a serious ethical analysis that aligns with the deeper extensions of the meaning of love. And so in those circumstances, I would say that there are certain types of interventions beyond therapy where it is appropriate to do things even if they do come at a cost to the individual human being. But this cost should not be indulgence of desire, competitive advantage, and definitely not coercive national control over a population. Rather, they should be in the spirit of love, voluntarily given and donated costs in the service of something self-evidently noble. So for example, as a physici physician, what comes to my mind is the idea that a surgeon might take a drug that would calm his hands, even if it cost him something in way of length of life or functioning of life, if it would calm his hands so he can do a more delicate operation on the eye of a child, for example. That seems to me a moral use of, of our biotechnology and neurotechnology beyond therapy. So it's the spirit in which we accept and relate to what is given and what is possible and what is good. I, I mentioned earlier in my remarks that the word human comes from the word earth or soil. It's interesting that the same Latin root is the root of our word humility. It seems to me that the kind of humility that we are called to as Christians is the kind that is both appreciative of the created order, deeply humbled by the responsibilities and the possibilities for good, for love, and it's that kind of understanding that is capable of guiding our uses of our advancing biotechnology. In the absence of that kind of comprehensive view of what life is, where it came from, what it's for, I think we're going to have a lot of trouble. In the, in the presence of that humility, I think we will go forward. We'll stumble our way a little bit forward, but I believe we will go forward into a really wonderful, wonderful future, rich in possibilities 
and rich in worship. Thank you very much.